when Farrell has a dream, Joseph's locked up in jail and he gets called in to interpret Farrell's dream. He says, I know it was from God because it happened twice because you dreamt twice. It repeated. And so it's like God's mark. Is that it, and so this is what I call the scroll of time. That time from the divine perspective to me is not linear. It's like a scroll where events are repeating, cycling over and over again. The beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. And I think God shows us that all through scripture. Hey, you've stumbled across a podcast called Blurry Creatures. We talk about creatures in the biblical context, try to give you answers to all the weird stuff that's happened to you or a friend or your family or somebody you know, or just stuff you've read in history, or maybe things your pastors talked about at church that you never made sense of. The weird is welcome here on Blurry Creatures. We're bringing on Ryan Peterson today, author of several books about the Nephilim, the Judgment of the Nephilim, and the Final Nephilim. Great dude, good friend of the show. He's been on several times. If you haven't listened to some of our previous episodes, maybe that'll give you some context for this one. Yeah, if this is your first episode, you're diving in a little bit, but it's not too bad. We talk a little bit about CERN and time travel on this one. If you want to support the show, we have a lot of members who sponsor the podcast. It's blurrycreatures.com slash members. Can't say thanks enough to all the people who, you know, find it important enough to help us keep going. And there's a lot of you out there, and we can't say thank you enough. If you want to get a shirt, we, we just launched a pre-order for new shirts blurrycreatures.com slash merch we've got a campaign shirt throwback to the 80s we got some new bigfoot merch and obviously a smithsonian's where are the bones t-shirt as well so head over there sponsor the show support the podcast we spent a lot of time making this this show editing and recording and researching it's just a non-stop blurry journey and we can't say thank you enough to all those who sponsor the show let's get ryan on this one Thank you out there for those who support it. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. Well, And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Well, welcome back to the show, Ryan. Uh, Ryan Peterson, for those of you guys who have just tuning into the podcast and have, haven't heard our previous interviews with you, you've written some books about the Nephilim, which is one of our favorite topics, um, The Judgment of the Nephilim, and that kind of launched you into the Nephilim space. And uh, you've been on a couple times before. We've talked about your books, you know, all things Nephilim. But uh, we were just chatting before the show that you said you just had a a viral, kind of like your most viral video about CERN. And people are always messaging us. They always love to talk about CERN. They want us to talk about CERN. So welcome back to Blurry Creatures. And uh, what do you think about your your video that specifically that was getting people excited? And, and what, have, what have you found out about CERN that perhaps it makes you interested in it. Yeah. So first off, fellas, thank you for having me back on. I appreciate it. It's great to be on. Congratulations on all your success of the show, Thanks. Uh, you know, both in video and on, the, and on the podcast. Glad to see it. Uh, well-deserved. I'm glad you guys are getting the word out and awakening people to everything happening in the supernatural realm. So uh, in terms of the CERN episode, yeah. So um, obviously you're firing the machine back up on July 5th. And so uh, mm -hmm. my Thursday night theology show which is live i did it uh, the thursday beforehand so maybe the second or the third of july and like again like you said it was my by far my, my my most my most popular episode but also the one with the most challenges uh logistically yeah. from tech issues and glitches and it kind of went with uh -huh. the theme of the show because the entire thing what i want to do because a lot of things about cern out there i wanted to explain 
what it actually was, the machine, the particle collider, and like, and what they're trying to achieve, but using their own words from the CERN website, from their actual research on their website. So there could be no mm. questioning that where I'm getting this stuff from. Right. And so right on the website, they talk about, they have a page about finding other dimensions. And the idea that basically they believe that in the particle collision, the data that's really being recorded is what happens after the collision. And, they, and their hope is that they can see into another dimension, get glimpses into other dimensions that they on their website say exist and are invisible to the human eye, but that hopefully through the machine, through the collider, the halogen collider, they can actually locate them. And so my whole theory when it comes to whether we're talking about CERN, anything dealing with quantum physics, the research into transhumanism is that this is what the Bible has been talking about for millennia mm. and explain how the Bible tells us that, that God created that the, you know, Romans one, that the visible things of creation are revealed by things that are invisible, that we can understand God's invisible work through creation. And so the, the Bible is constantly telling us that the spiritual realm is invisible to, to the human eye. And so I said, you know, so once again, we see with CERN, you know, man trying to achieve, you know, what God controls through our own might, through our own intelligence, through our own strength, rather than trusting in God to access the spirit realm. And so, um, and I went through a couple of examples. I mean, one of the clear examples you see is, is with the prophet Elisha, when he is surrounded by the Assyrian army. And of course, his servant Gehazi is, you know, worried. He sees the army, the enemy, the enemy's looking for Elisha, and he's, you know, saying, panicking, what are we going to do? They're coming to kill us. And Elisha prays and says, God, you know, open his eyes. And God basically super gives, gives Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, vision into the spirit realm. And they see that they're actually surrounded by an angelic army. There's a host of armies, you know, chariots and horses of fire. And so Elisha clearly had that vision already. So the Bible is telling us and revealing that, yes, there is a spirit realm and it is invisible to the human eye, but that, but that even a human being can be given the power to have sight into that realm. And I believe that CERN is trying to do the same thing. Do you think a lot of the biblical writers had that gift? I do. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you, you see, you know, Daniel, Ezekiel, I mean, Ezekiel chapter one, you know, what he's seeing, you know, the, the this creature where it has the eyes and the wheels upon wheels and, it's hovering in the air. I mean, he's literally seeing these things outside, you know? And so I believe that God allowed the prophets to see into the spirit realm on many occasions. It's interesting. It's interesting. Cause that's like, not just Elisha, but Nate, I say like biblically speaking, like you see that with Jacob where they had the two camps and there was this angelic camp and then their stories, you know, it takes a little Google search, right? You, you, Google stories, like you're talking about of missionaries that, that prayed for, and I remember this one story, and it's, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but the context is, is what's important, is that they prayed for protection. They were out in in the wild. A, a tribe came to wipe them out and then didn't. And then when they ended up speaking to the tribe, they had said, we came to, to kill you. And there was a whole army here outside, walking around, around outside your tent. There are very real times, whether it be biblically speaking or even like the miraculous, you know, in more in the modern day where... And Nate, we talk about the time the veil is either thinned or or removed at certain times, and yeah, yeah, it, it definitely. And I, I believe it happened, I, and I believe it still happens today. And, and you find that often in in accounts from missionaries, you know, also in in certain countries. I think you find that more manifest. You know, you find those manifestations even more often as well. You know, my family's all from Jamaica and the Caribbean. You hear lots of stories of people seeing spirits, having spiritual encounters. Where you get visions into again through the veil, like you know, when the veil is temporarily mm -hmm. removed. Well, I was going to say in that vision, right? What does he see exactly? Doesn't he see like chariots of fire and they're all over the hills and they're that's kind of blurry, right? That's like what we what we podcast about all the time. Is, is... exactly. Is these entities, and that's the supernatural realm, and I think what we try to do a lot on our show is give people more modern day phenomenon that's happening so they can trust these stories, like Elisha saying that he's seeing this stuff. And I don't know why, but a lot of Christians just have a hard time believing those stories. But if you've had some sort of paranormal experience, then you go backwards, you're like, oh, these 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 stories of people seeing this stuff is it's actually it's legitimate. And it's there's not new either. It's not new. Yeah, not new under the sun, right? We said I say it almost every episode. <laughs> it's yeah. like. 
nothing there's no 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 new dece- no new deceptions no new lies and no and- exactly exactly and, and not only is it just not new it's it's going to repeat right and that's right. that's like you know in the final nephilim that's one of the main themes yeah you think we're all going to see soon right absolutely i think that's the great tribulation i think of the great tribulation right when there's so many implications to jesus saying as it was in the days of noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man there's a there's the the genetic aspect of that and the sons of god but also i think also when you look at the days of noah the veil was removed you know before the flood the veil was removed you had there was no barrier adam and eve yeah. could speak to god in the garden of eden eve obviously speaks to the speaks to the devil right obviously they have a conversation in genesis 3 you have god mm-hmm punishing Adam, Eve, and the serpent all together in a group. So you have cherubim blocking the entrance to the Garden of Eden, flaming sword. So the barrier was gone at that time. And so I think, again, in the Great Tribulation, it'll be fully removed. Uh, Once again, you have the return of fallen angels openly manifesting on the earth, you know, and and it's, it's, you know, it's like a repeat of the flood, where in the flood judgment, of course, you have the waters coming from the fountains of the deep, as well as from the windows of heaven, now it's going to be an angelic flood. You have the angels who are released from the abyss mm. at the fifth trumpet, yeah. uh, who I believe are the Genesis 6 angels. And then you, of course, have the remaining fallen angels who are cast out of heaven in Revelation 12 when they when they are finally evicted by Michael and the righteous angels. You know, And, and, and mm. Jesus even said that men's heart will fail them for what they see coming upon the earth, that people will literally drop dead. When, and I think it's because you're going to see fallen angels openly interacting, openly speaking, openly yeah. manifesting before humanity. It's going to get wild. So, I mean, we started this, though, with CERN, right? And so there's some yeah. things about CERN, right? Like there, first off, there's a statue of Shiva, out exactly. front, which is this Indian god of the life force. And then, you know, people love to give us... A, a, a lot of a guff about our our logo and in, in, in the in the eye and it, it's got some meaning and, and we, it doesn't right it's it, it, we have to put this to bed all the time but it you know it's 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 meant to sort yeah. of poke fun at it and then it's also a creature eye regardless of this they just fired it up again what do you what do you think about the timing and what do you think they're really actually doing because they they released an article right away about these exotic penta quirks and yeah, yeah. tetra quirks and these these things they discovered on July 5th and you did your, you actually did your show through your Facebook page on, you know, before previous to this. So we, uh, this is kind of fun cause we get sort of get the recap. I don't know if you recapped yeah. it, but yeah, no, they, I didn't, I didn't. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so they allegedly found some things, the, but the story of what they found new, these new subatomic particles was nothing earth shattering at all. Uh, but I think, it, I think the end game is, is much bigger. I mean, I mean, they, like, again, that's why I said, I, I quoted from their own site. They are trying to, access and tap into another dimension into other dimensions and something i compared it to was really tower of babel mm. right to me tower of babel was the ancient version of cern right where they you know it was to reach heaven i think it was an attempt again to to pierce the veil to open the veil and I think you know, one of the most shocking verses you see is god's comment on the tower of babel and again think about it it's technology it's high technology Right, this 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 level of construction. So again, it's using technology to access the spirit realm. And God Mm. says, you know, if if they complete this, there's nothing which they imagine which can be restrained from them. There's nothing that whatever they want to do, they could achieve it. So to me, that's clearly God is saying that to say that there is some power that they were trying to access that if they finish this, they could have it. So I, I think mm. CERN, I think so. I think the stakes of what's being achieved with, or what they're trying to achieve with CERN is much higher than that. And I think that it's no coincidence that you see, you know, Shiva, the statue out front, or that the, that you see a six 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 logo. Anytime to me, we're seeing things like this. It's the convergence of prophecy and science. It's not a coincidence. There is always yeah. going to be some spiritual inspiration behind what these scientists are trying to do. And do you think that the scientists are clueless about this, or do you think that somewhere behind closed doors they kind of know what they're doing, or do the elites sort of, they know what their mission is and they don't tell the minions? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I think it's a mix of some scientists who don't know what they're doing or don't aren't aware of any spiritual implications, but I think there are some who have to. And I mean, and, and the thing about it too is that when it comes to my research, I'm old school. You know, I love stuff from centuries gone by. The idea, this separation of science and spirituality is something... That is a convention of the 20th century. Prior to the 19 to the 1900s, there was no separation between science and spiritualism. Most of the biggest spiritualists were scientists or intellectuals. Mm-hmm. So the notion that a scientific advancement 
could access the spirit realm. Look at the the, the television, right? The original ver- purpose of the television, right, was invented as the cathode ray tube. The whole purpose of the cathode ray tube was to access the spiritual realm. That was the original purpose really? of a television. And so, hmm. um, and it kind of still does that now, <laughs> right? With yeah, all the yeah. demonic content that can come out of a television, right? Yeah. But that was the original purpose. So again, you know, but when was that created? In the 19th century, before we had this artificial you know, this thing that we, we think now in our lifetimes now, if you're a scientist, you don't believe in anything spiritual, right. but it used to be all merged. That's how it's been for the history of humanity. So, mm-hmm. so again, I think it's in the same vein that there are lots of people who understand the spiritual implications who are at CERN and understand that, Hey, this might have spiritual implications, whether it's bringing in Shiva or bring in Apollyon or whoever mm-hmm. it is they, they particularly are interested in worshiping. Mm. I, yeah. I think, I think the tower of Babel, is, is a fascinating parallel. You know, you think about, when we talk about, we've talked about it in past episodes about the ziggurats and the idea that they were essentially trying to build this access point or stargate or portal into heaven. And then there's the story of Nimrod climbing the tower and then trying to, sh- trying to war with heaven, essentially shoot yeah. arrows into heaven. Right. And, and it's, it feels the same in the sense that they're trying to open this thing. And I think it's, I was going to ask you what you thought about what their, what their plans were. And, and I know we've postulated Nate about, them opening the abyss potentially and, and, and you talked about Apollyon and and letting out the the watchers and they out of their imprisonment in the earth and what do you think why now do you think it's a quickening uh, that they're, they're really trying to bring about this this golden age and that and they think that that reaching into this other dimension and, and perhaps opening these portals and bringing these entities through or trying to reach or, or communicate is the way that they're doing that in order to get back to this golden age or yeah, I mean, I, I do, right? And that's that's what really so much of the high level spiritualism occult is really about. It's really about whether it's British spiritualism, theosophy, Kabbalah. It's all about really trying to access the angelic realm and bring them back. Even Matthew Henry, who has one of the most famous commentaries in the Bible, when he wrote on the Tower of Babel, he specifically said he felt he his interpretation was Nimrod was trying to bring back the angels from the days of Noah back to the earth mm. and bring back that antediluvian era the era of atlantis all these things to bring back that knowledge that secret wisdom and that era of angels and humans openly interacting so i think it's this is this the same thing different technology different era so i have an, a, a question we talk a lot about you know the megalithic structures and things that sounded like ancient versions of cern on the show whether it be you know doorways and rocks and places like machu picchu or other places around the United States even that we can't get to because are mysteriously protected by the national parks and things. Are all portals the same, you think? Or is CERN something different? Because it sounds like there are certain places, high places, thin places. Our show's been getting more and more into this idea of doorways and portals. And I just wonder what you think separates CERN from like all these other places that are supposedly doorways to other dimensions. And Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if... If when they constructed the facility, if they were thinking about those things like ley lines and sacred sacred locations right. and things like that. But I think it's obvious all through scripture, there are certain locations. God, right, has location, right? The temple can only be in one location on the earth. That's it. It cannot be anywhere else. God's temple can only be on one mountain. So, so whether it's for the divine righteous side or for the evil side, there are definitely sacred locations. And, you know, in judgment of the Nephilim, you know, that's one of the chapters I, I write all about the Jordan River and how that was to me, I call that the area 51 of the Bible, because there are so many times you see the veil being pierced at the Jordan River. We talked about Elisha. He, you know, he he parted, he was able to part the Jordan River with his mantle, supernaturally, like the Red Sea parted. Elijah was raptured to heaven in chariots of fire at the Jordan River, right? You have Naaman, the, uh, the, the commander, you know, uh, the, the Syrian military commander who had leprosy, dips himself seven times in the Jordan River, comes mm-hmm. out, he's healed. The baptism of Jesus Christ at the Jordan River, something I've been looking into a lot lately, but at the Jordan River, what do you see there? Heaven opens. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. God the Father speaks from heaven, the full intersection of the heavenly and spiritual realm. So I believe that's a, definitely a location of a thin location, so to speak, in terms of seeing the veil being pierced and us getting a, a glimpses 
if not full views into the spirit realm at, at that location. It's a tough topic because, you know, most of the creatures we talk about a lot, I mean, it sounds more and more like they're coming from some other place into our realm and going to and from. And so that's yeah. why the, the portal stuff is, is interesting to me. And I wonder if CERN is sort of letting some of these creatures in, these things that they, maybe they can, they think they can recruit an army or something, you know, but... I- it feels to me more like a control thing. Like we talk about these places on earth and you talk about ley lines, Ryan, and, and these thin spots that exist, right? And, and there's ideas of portals or opening portals through ritual and stuff like that where but this almost feels like it's a control thing, like where they kind of want to manufacture what feels like a gateway and then be able to kind of control it in a way that I, I would expect or maybe the way I think about things in the natural where these where the, where we hypothesize that there's stargates or portals, we want to call them exist, that it kind of things sort of happen. It doesn't feel like a control thing unless unless there's some sort of ritual that opens it and something comes through. But this feels almost like a like scientifically, we have man trying to open and control a doorway, so they can almost pick. It's, it's like it feels like the control has always been on the other side. Like things can come through. Right, um, and but unless you watch Mission Four and One, we, maybe people go through the other way. They just don't come back. But yeah, but maybe this is a way that this is what it feels like to me is a way to con- try, try to construct and tr- control in order to sort of kind of maybe you can pick and choose. It's kind of like you reach in the bag, you decide what you're getting. Um, exactly, and, and, exactly, and it's not even just anything about matter, right? Things coming through the portal. It's also time, right? And this again yeah. is going back to what science says that if you can open the dimension, you can even go back into time or see into time. You know, so even that is something that, again, you can find reputable scientists saying that if you were able to achieve what CERN's trying to achieve, that you have that power to do that. So, yeah, so I think it is a controlled, like an attempt to make, you know, uh, an artificial portal, so to speak, essentially. Do you think that there's a, uh, this is a crazy thought, and this is, my, Nate, this might just be wild, like just, you know, a dumb Luke thought, but I think there's kind of an effort then, if, you, if, we, if we were to just take what we know about quantums in space time in the bending of space time. Do you think there could be a, at some point or potentially now some sort of concerted effort to bend time to essentially go back and try to prevent some of like this thing about this. And we're talking about, and we love sci-fi time travel movies, back to the future, right? We're eighties guys, Nate. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, yeah. It makes you oh, think, yeah. I wonder like if there's the possibility to bend space time per this Einstein. This is just a big DeLorean is what you're saying. Why wouldn't very expensive one. nefarious people try to go back and and do what the you know the Watchers and everything in Gen Six couldn't do was try to prevent exactly. Messiah, right? And, I, and I, it's a it's a wild thought. I, I don't think God in His sovereignty. I don't think that there's any way that, that He would allow that governing all things natural, right? I, I I just but I wonder if there's not some sort of impetus there because you either do that, right? You do that. Or you play the long game, which is you try to prevent the biblical prophecy, those things which to come, which is your judgment, ultimately, if you're in, you're in the darkness, right? Is that you're just trying to make it last as long as possible. So these things can't come to pass. So the things, the biblical prophecies that are there, those markers, you just push them out ineffably by, you know, by removing mankind's ability to be human. Those kind of things we see in transhumanism. It's just a crazy thought. It, it, it's, it's not that crazy, too- though, to me, because, again, you, you kind of nailed, the, to me, the, the whole underlying theme here, which is the long game is prophecy. It's right. about undoing God's declared prophecy, right? And this is right. like, you know, because think about it. I mean, God, his entire name, reputation is rested on prophecy. Isaiah 46, verse 10, God says, you know I am God because I have declared the end from the beginning and from mm. ancient times the thing that shall, that shall be. So God is saying, if you want to know who I am and how I'm different from all the fallen angels, from all the demons, it's because I can tell you the future mm. and my word won't fail. So God's resting everything on that. And obviously, again, it's like that, that, that so much of what's taking place in this war is the devil trying to undo prophecy. So I think if there's a chance to go back and have a second chance to try and undo a prophecy, of course, the devil will try and do it. And if you look in, mm. you know, the book of Daniel's, you know, prophecies of the Antichrist, it says that he's going to seek to change times and seasons. Mm. So that even the time, the way time is measured itself is going to change in the Great Tribulation to some way. Right. So mm. that's crazy. I think it's something that's big on, on the on God's mind and on the devil's mind. God himself, I believe, you know, even even the expression of God's name, the divine name, Yod Vadhe, Yahweh. 
I believe is an expression of God existing outside of time. I am that wow. I am the all yeah. existent one, right? Jesus being past, present, future, all at once. The you know, uncre- quantum yeah, the uncreated, right? He's yeah, yeah. 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 Like he's existing in all times at, at at all times, right? And so the devil knows this. The devil, John knew, knew this. Like think about the book of Revelations, the only book that's written outside of time. John's told to write things while he's in heaven. He's seeing, Jesus said, I'm going to reveal to you, Pat, things that have been, that are, and what shall be. So he's seeing past, present, and future all at once in front of his eyes and recording it. So he wrote that book outside of time. So I think time itself is a very valuable tool in this ongoing war between God and the devil. Hmm. Mm. And it's almost like they have to, if they come into our realm, they're sort of on the road and they can't get off. They can they can try to manipulate while they're on, but they, they're on this this timeline, this road of time. And one thing we talk about a lot is how Earth mirrors heaven, right? And so I'm thinking about CERN. It's an enormous amount of energy, and I'm thinking the Nephilim creatures knew how to tap into the Earth's energy, and so they could probably open portals just based on understanding how much energy it takes maybe to open up something like this. Right. Whereas CERN needs an incredible amount of energy. It's more like the, 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 the knockoff crappy version of a portal, you know, in terms of if it was versus Nephilim technology that, that they probably understood way more than we do. We're almost like we've stumbled on this technology, but we still don't know what we're doing. And we're just kind of, exactly. I think the Nephilim creatures knew exactly what they were doing and knew how to, manipulate this energy so if you think about cern from just like a scientific perspective with no god involved it doesn't really make any sense like what are they really trying to do they have this giant facility with an enormous amount of energy it has to be something nefarious to me because what what is the 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 layman's explanation if people don't believe it's supernatural it just seems obvious to me that something's going on that well, I mean, they're looking for the God particle, right? I mean, literally, it, it, feels why is to me, that? It, it feels to me like the like the promise of the serpent. It's like, you will be like the gods. If mankind can find the God particle, this building block, whatever they want to call it, dark matter, whatever it is, this thing that they that, from which things come from, right? And harness that. It feels like the promise of the garden, right? Is that you can... It's not be like God. It's be like the gods. It's 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 like like the Elohim, which exactly, yeah, yeah, which is, and, which and is that too, elevated yeah. state, right? Yeah. Right. It's like yeah. that, right? Yeah. It's almost like you have the power to create worlds, create to create dimensions, right? And it isn't interesting too that in that same passage, right? What did what did Satan say? Your eyes will be open. So again, it's about seeing something that you can't see with your eyes right now. But if you could just tap into this, you'll see something completely different, right? So. So, yes, I I think it's all there's there's no way that, you know, for all this effort and the computing power, I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures of the server rooms there. I mean, it's insane. And the sheer energy and money, there's definitely a a much bigger agenda. And I think it's true. It's it's, it's essentially being like the Elohim, trying to access that power to whether it's getting to the to building blocks of the universe to build your own worlds or just opening another world. Do you, mm. I mean, one of the things I think with, with connecting this to biblical prophecy, and that's something I know you like to do and you do very well. What do you think, uh, this is my question, what do you think is, is the next step with this? Like, I mean, if we're looking in your biblical prophecy guy, if you're looking at where do you think this fits, you don't need a timeline because everybody likes to put numbers on everything, but, but maybe just in, in the chronological or, or sort of the, from here to the end. Right, so, right, yeah. So, you know, you think about it from a purely technological standpoint, when you look at the book of Revelation, everything's in place. Right. There's nothing left that you see from a text standpoint. Right. You have the mark of the beast. That's obviously something conceivable now. It's very conceivable to have a technology that you can literally inject into your hands that's connected to Wi-Fi that you can use to buy things. Right. That's very. So we we that's something that people could readily see is happening. And it is happening. Right. And, right. you know, you see it in Sweden and other countries that are injecting RFID chips and things like that. Then, you talk, you know, you look at the two witnesses being killed. And it says everyone in the world sees their dead bodies in the streets for three and a half days. So clearly, again, easily achievable, right? They're, they they have like, a, you know, Meta, Facebook has, you know, these air balloons that they're sending that they put in remote regions, whether it's in Africa, Southeast Asia, where they're just literally sending balloons that are giving transmitters, pumping out free Wi-Fi. You know, they want everybody in the world On <laughs> online. Yeah. So again, yeah. easily, easily you can have, hundreds of millions of people watching the same video no problem right today 
What's left, and I think it's not discussed enough in the book of Revelation, is that the fact that the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to have literal supernatural power. They're going to perform real acts that are supernatural to win the world over. And I think where CERN fits in is if they reported any time in the next year that, okay, we, you know, there was, you know, a particle or some part disappeared when CERN fired. Would it be, you know, people are ready to accept that, yeah, there was actual teleportation or, right. you know, some type of energy was unleashed. There are things I think now that this is setting the stage to, to really see supernatural things occur, just like you see with disclosure. But the, the, all, the, all the government's now saying, yes, we've been studying this for 50 years. We have files that are declassifying. To me, it's setting the stage to say to accept the supernatural. Because I think at this point, there are a lot of things CERN could announce that people wouldn't would say, oh, wow, this is this is amazing. You know, like, you know, we're because we were being prepped to accept extraterrestrial life and the supernatural. So I think that's the real role, because that that's the key. It has to win over. You know, it's a, it even says like, you know, the false prophet will call fire from heaven. You know, this is these are things that people are going to this is going to be a part of everyday mm. life. Uh, you know, in the Great Tribulation. And so I think when you see things like CERN, it gives a legitimacy to a one day a scientist saying, yeah, you know, um, we we fired it up and something came through. <laughs> you know, when we- I have a thought, but it, it, I wonder if it is more about time. I wonder, because I do think already that they know there are portals and, and, and gates already in some places in the earth. I mean, we had several guests who had some wild ideas about that, but uh, some people think that the... Uh, <laughs> This, the, 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 uh, you know, like all the observatories in the world, like there's the Catholic church owns one in the, in the desert. Right. And some people say that's not, they're not looking at the stars. There's something else going on there. It's a, it's a cover, right? It's a cover for whatever else they're really doing. It makes you think that if CERN is more like a DeLorean, it's more like a time bender thing than it is a portal, because I think we already have portals. And that's what you see a lot on this show is that you get close to the truth, like whatever theory you have. Whether it's like we didn't go to the moon, but you know they faked the moon landing, and it's and I always wonder if it's a hybrid. Like maybe they showed us a fake version of it, but maybe they actually went and and did something else, <laughs> and they didn't sh- they didn't show us what they showed everybody else. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, yeah, it's sure. it's it's never it's never the easy conspiracy theory on the surface. It's always more complicated, and I, I just wonder that. about CERN <laughs> yeah. if there's something else going on that feels even more nefarious than a, just a straight up portal. What do you, you know, I don't know if that triggers anything in your brain, but it's, yeah. it's that's, I mean, that's yeah, I mean, the time is, a, I think time is an interesting idea. And I think it's interesting too, like we talked about, we talked about Herman, like, which is now occupied by a UN base. Exactly. So, but listen, like all the stuff biblically, the kind of weird stuff, a lot of it happened on mountaintops, which is really strange too. And so we talk about portals yeah. and stargates and, and stuff that happens, but there's transfiguration and, you know, Gen Six is top of Mount Hermon. You know, and on Mount and Sinai, Mount Sinai, Mount things, Ararat. Things happen on on mountains, and and I, I don't think that's that's far fetched. Honestly, I, I and it kind of actually is a good segue, Ryan, because I wanted to come back to something you said earlier, and that was talking about the River Jordan. Because when we had you on before, we didn't really get into that a ton, but you said you've been doing some research on it, and and I think th- talking about man constructing a portal, whether it be for time or to open the abyss, whatever, maybe all of the above, right? Maybe Nate's right. Maybe it's more, it's probably more nuanced to, than that. It's, it, it's yes. And right. But naturally speaking, then you've been diving in the Jordan river. Talk to us a little bit about that. Because I, th- I think talking about something that is now God, God, God given in, in that place is the antithesis of CERN really. Exactly. And, and, and again, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense that, right? The devil's going to mimic everything God does, right? Yes. Be as God. I will be like the most high. And so it's always a mimicry, right? And so just recently, I've been looking at the Jordan River just because I've been digging into the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is something I really haven't researched much beyond how it establishes scripture, right? Obviously, it's right. The, the, the greatest verification of the accuracy of the Bible that I've known since I was a kid, but I've never really digged into, you know, the text themselves, what was more prominent among what was written and who wrote them, right? And so what I found, what I've been noticing, and I think from scripture and from research is that where the Jordan River meets the Dead Sea is Qumran. And I think that's the place of the crossing. I think that's what's called Bethabara or Bethabara in scripture. I believe that's where 
specific location in the Jordan River where most of these supernatural things were happening. The place the crossing is where is like crossed into the promised lands. It's and, and you're specifically told in the New Testament that that is where John the Baptist was baptized at uh-huh. Bethabara. You know, they just you know the names are different in the Old and New Testament, but it's the same location. And it also says near the city of Adam. So you even wonder, was Adam there? Mm. Right. So again, you talk about these locations. And of course, that's where, of course, you have the baptism of Jesus where heaven opens. And so one thing I think about, and again, linking it kind of discern, bringing it all together is another quant, you know, you think about quantum entanglement, that's, you know, particles connected through, again, through time, you know, that are affecting each other. And I think prophecy right. works the same way. That like John had to be in this spot. Like there are specific things that because it's connecting God's prophecy through time even. And now I'm at the point where I'm really wondering, you know, you hear the voice crying in the wilderness. You know, there are, I mean, you go back to the 17, 1800s, a lot of theologians said that, and interesting, this is before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that John lived in Qumran. John the Baptist, that's where he was because the wilderness, quote unquote, is the desert of Judea which at that time would put him right in that area. And so you, I wonder if that was, if he could have been even been author of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which of course you get to 1947. And when you have the voice of the word of God crying out in the wilderness, because we found 15,000 biblical fragments that have been maintained for, you know, almost 2000, 2000 plus years. And so, so that's what, so it's really interesting that you have so much supernatural activity there. That was also where that's the same wilderness that Jesus was tempted by the devil, you know, right after his baptism. As he continues, it's right after he leaves John the Baptist that he is now fasting for four days and four nights, and the devil confronts the Lord. The voice of the word of God crying out in the wilderness. Well, that's interesting that the demons and the devil are in that dry places in the desert. Yeah, exactly. Why specifically? I mean, if they're spirit beings, why are they forced to be in a geolocation? It wouldn't make sense, right? Unless there's something else we don't understand. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's all linked. It's all connected. That that, Again, when you think about it from the the natural, non-artificial man-made side, that there's definite portals, locations that all have an enormous amount of significance. In fact, when you look in scripture, it actually says that John, uh, when he describes his birth, it says that basically like like, that he was in that area for years before he kind of really kicked off his ministry, baptizing and obviously preaching the coming of Messiah. So there, God wanted him there for a reason. And then also when you look at even at the archaeology of Qumran, you know, you see there there's a number of baptismal pools. Hmm. You know, so some of it is just very similar in what the way he was living and how they were living in that community there. Oh, that's fascinating. I love it. We talked about it last episode of just a little bit about how, you know, the devil has these plans and then then David rolls out with a stone, you know. <laughs> and and then there's just these jars of clay inside these hill, you know, and just these pots yeah. full of full of truth. And it's always just this simple thing that really reveals and, and takes the, 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 the enemy's plans out. Amen. Do, and so I guess the, the question then in my mind is just, you know, about time itself, because we've had a lot of people come on our show and say really odd things like seeing reenactment of Civil War battles on their inside their house. Wow. Or, 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 you know what I mean? Like they've had paranormal experiences that or like ta- sound or time dem- loss or time loss. Yeah. Or yeah, time slippage. loss. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, and those are the hardest ones to understand from a biblical standpoint of like, how is, how can we go back in time and how can these demons seem to reenact parts of history? It just, it, it sounds so odd. And I never really know what to think about that. Again, you know, God, I feel like God kind of tells us that's how he has arranged the universe. Because he's saying that he's going to speak to us through similitudes, that events are going to repeat, right? You think about Joseph, when Pharaoh has a dream, Joseph's locked up in jail and he gets called in to interpret Pharaoh's dream. He says, I know it was from God because you had, because it happened twice, because you dreamt twice, it repeated. Mm. 
And so it was like God's mark. Is that it, and so this is what I call the scroll of time. That time from the divine perspective to me is not linear. It's like a scroll where events are repeating, cycling over and over again. The beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. You know, and so I think that, and, and I think God tells us, shows us that all through scripture, right? He tells us, just look at the titles of Jesus, right? Jesus in the Old Testament, there are messianic prophecies that call the Messiah, David, calls him David, hmm. David, my servant, re- referencing Messiah. So it's like, again, it's going through time saying that David is just a, a temporary picture of the future Messiah. So it's always connecting, it's right? Like you have types right? and shadows yeah. and foreshadows. So I think on the other side, on the sinister side, you can have the devil recreating his events from from the past in a similar fashion because things are just repeating over. It's mm. I think all this is a cycle that you know we talk about double fulfillments of prophecy. I think most prophecies have multiple fulfillments throughout history until the Great Tribulation. Mm, that's and all the best films, like the first two sec, op- the opening scene is telling you exactly how it's going to end. And yes. those are always the best films, you know, yeah, and exactly. I think it's, it's fascinating. It's like Genesis doesn't, you know, it didn't get a lot of airtime growing up in the church. And now I think that's why people are just tuning into our podcast and sending us so many, because we spend so much time in Genesis as a journey podcast. Like what the heck happened in Genesis? Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, it's, it's going to happen again. That's why I think it's so important, right? It's, like Ryan, like you said, like the we know the the days of Noah, right? Like and, and how you know people want to interpret that and say you know people have told sent us messages saying just, oh it just means it's... sin. <laughs> that is such a it feels like such a a two D version. It's much more yeah, than that for sure. If, if God if God told us that if God told us which He said in Isaiah forty six, I have declared the end from the beginning. I've told I've told I've already revealed everything that's going to happen. We have to go back, right? That's the mission. We have to go and figure it out. And I think it's. It's days of Noah, it's Genesis 315. It's the Exodus. All these things are telling us. I mean, just look at the parallels. In the Exodus, you have the judgment of water turned to blood. You have that in the Great Tribulation. There's a judgment of locusts. You have locusts released at the fifth mm-hmm. trumpet of Revelation chapter nine. There's supernatural darkness. You have supernatural. I mean, this is not a coincidence. This is God showing us again through time this, this rippling, you know, uh quantum repetition, if you will. And so think about this too. You know, one of the my favorite prophecies, uh, mysteries in the Bible I got to, that I got to write on uh, in Revelation 17, when it, when the angels explain to John what the seven head beast is, what is this? What does it mean? What does it symbolize? And he says the seven heads are seven kings. Five were, one is, one is yet to come and shall continue a short space. And the eighth head, he is of the seven and goeth into perdition, you know. What does that mean? It's this crazy (laughs) time bending prophecy that's telling you, and I believe it's telling us that the Antichrist himself has been on earth before. He's been here five, you know, in I believe five times. And at the time John is writing Revelation, which I believe was circa 96 AD, the angel saying, One is one of these days, meaning he's around right now, and there's still one to come. And then there's another who's just of those seven. So again, it's it's a prophecy, but it's, it's going back, forth, present all in one verse. Mm. And so again, and so time, all this plays a huge, huge role in how thinking, how God is revealing himself and revealing his will uh, through time. I, you know, we're, I mean, obviously we're an eighties show. We love the eighties. So, I mean, yeah. let's get weird here. Can uh, like the Terminator <laughs> could, you know, the Terminator is, that's basically what the story of the Terminator is, right? So could back. angels send, send warriors back in time to, to prevent something from happening? Do you I believe think, that's I think possible? Terminator is is like the devil's ultimate dream. If I could just go back, right? I mean, the scripture says if they knew, what they, what they, yeah. it, had they known crucifying was going to lead to destruction, right. they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have crucified Christ. But if you could go back to the birth to Mary and just stop the whole thing, I, I think that's I think the Terminator is an ex, <laughs> is a, was on some level inspired to express the desire of the devil, right? To go back, right? And of course, John Connor, right? Jesus Christ, John Connor. I mean, it's not a, to me the, the initials are not a coincidence. JC, so maybe. let's so let's get real weird here. Oh, let's boy. do it. <laughs> you said earlier that God is the only being outside of time. So if Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, together they have, uh, that's my understanding of it, they have the genetic ability to be outside of a time, but everything else is a created being from Christ himself, so therefore they are locked into time. Is that how you see it? That is how I see it, yes. Okay, boom. 
Exactly. So there you go. There you go, Nate. Professor <laughs> Nate. Put on your hat. They can't send a Terminator back in time because they are a product of it. Maybe they're not dying as fast as we are. Yeah. But they can only bend and move. They can't. They like you said. They couldn't go back in time and kill the no. Messiah. I, I think they wish they could, but they can't. They can't exactly. Mm. I mean, obviously, if they they would have tried. Maybe they have tried. Or or or, or, or are trying. Trying. Yeah. <laughs> trying to bend. Yeah, I mean, time. what what keeps them from trying? And then that's another question I have is that like we see hu- the evolution of human technology. Do angels have this evolution of technology as well? You think? Is it getting crazier and crazier in their realms? I, I think so, right? And I think because God, you know, it's interesting that I think that it's it's amazing to see the way God operates, so like, you know, setting the parameters for angels, right? And, and if you think, you know, and this is something I have to talk about too, again, with, with you think about Apollyon and that prophecy from Revelation 17, how is the Antichrist on earth seven times? How does it even work? And I think that he that's, this being is allowed to indwell seven leaders throughout biblical history for a time. The God, so God is setting the parameters. So I think as we get close to the great tribulation, God is going to give more lenience to the fallen angels to do more. Mm-hmm. So, you know, God, because God is always, we see it in Job. God's always saying, hey, okay, you can damage Job's, his possessions and everything he loves, but don't touch him. Then in chapter two, it's okay. Now you can touch him and harm him, but you can't kill him. So it's always God setting the parameters, and I think it's going to open up even more to allow the angels to access more of what they have technologically or through occult, supernatural, dark power to unleash on Earth. Mm-mm. Yeah, we've talked about that, Nate. Like, there's the idea of this courtroom, right? That God has set all these, everything in is laid the foundations and set the rules, and the devil's just trying, and, and his minions are just trying to catch God on a technicality. They're trying to essentially maneuver within that. In order, to, which is fascinating to me, that like it's interesting, like the idea that of, of the pride. And I don't know what goes into that, but the idea that that you could beat the master at at his own game is 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 a whole other thing. But it's it's interesting that they like you talking to Job. They even had to ask permission, right? And, and then Revelation talks about how they will be given permission to they'll be released and given permission for a set amount of time. And then, and then that's over. Then they get put in the lake of fire, and it's all, and it's we're done. I mean, talk about God's ways are higher than ours, and and like understanding why, and it, sometimes I think it's something that could make your make your brain into mush, right? Yeah, but and and that connects through time too, by the way, right? Because you have Revelation chapter nine, right, where where sinful humanity finally achieves immortality, and I believe they do that by taking the mark of the beast, and that's of course when now you have the locusts, the fallen angels released from the abyss, and they're they're given permission to torment all who don't have the seal of God. So anyone who's unsaved, they torment them. And of course, that's when everyone wants to die, right? They would now yeah. people want to want to die, but they can't die. Death is fleeing from them. And, mm. you know, it's for five months, right? And it, which of course goes back to the days of Noah. Cause I, you know, when you look at the flood chronology in Genesis eight, the angels were the, the flood waters raged. And we're told in Genesis eight for 150 days. And so in Ezekiel 31, it says, then the day that the Assyrian, who I believe was the, the angelic leader of them, he says, I brought you down to the nether parts of the earth in the days that the floodwaters assuaged. So you had them being tormented, losing their kingdom, their Nephilim offspring, their wives, everything destroyed for 150 days. Then they're dragged down to the abyss under chains of darkness. Then in the end times, they're released for 150 days. So everything, so time really plays a big role in how God is unfolding prophecy. Yes, it's it's complex. I I, I guess yeah. my my thought is like these creatures that people see, I mean they're they're vast, they're weird, they're strange and they come out of they come out of somewhere. I don't think they're all here on earth. And we've, you know, people have come on our show and said that some of them look like insects. Some of them look like blonde-haired beings. Yeah. What do you think about that the vastness of the creatures themselves? I mean, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of descriptors in, in terms of all this weird stuff, and I think that's why our show is kind of hitting a nerve for, with a lot of people because they want to know. They want to know. Pe- they've seen something strange. They need, they need context for it, right? They want to try to figure. Yeah, out exactly. Yeah. I, I think everything, everything we're talking about, you know, it's really this. I, I, to me, I think that blurry creatures are somehow been permitted to go through the veil for a time, whether it's a night, whether it's five minutes. It's got through the veil so that now with human eyes, you can actually see it. And I think in terms of their different appearances, I think that's where humanity, like we're so like we're 
so young and so naive compared to these beings who have been alive for millennia mm. that, you know, I believe a lot of them are shapeshifters, that they can present themselves in all sorts of different ways. You know, I think, and I, in fact, I think that personally, that when you see the Revelation 12 war and those angels being cast to earth, I think they, they might come presenting themselves as beautiful beings, not mm. coming looking for a war and to, and to destroy anybody, but coming as beautiful, benevolent beings. They might say they're from another planet. That they're yeah. here to help us evolve. And I think that when you look at oh, yeah. creatures, it's the same idea that they can, it's just, they're taking their assuming form. And one thing that we really don't have a grasp on is the demonic realm, right? You know, how, how are demons, you know, when, when you look, re, you read the gospels, demons are everywhere. I mean, they're all over the place. Right. And it, it's the, the, Israel is overrun with demonic activity. So there are times where God is allowing more of that to happen, that these beings are coming. So to me, their ability to take different forms and different appearances is probably, to me, something they've always had an ability. But we, we know so little about it. It's like overwhelming to us to see the different forms they can take. But I think one day we're going to realize, wow, they they can do a hundred different forms. And we just never realized it because obviously we have a limited knowledge. I think, Nate, I think there's something there too, like with the watchers, right? When they talk about how they, they taught them how to do magic and spells and the cutting of roots, right? You talk about the, the things that they, and then I'm just connected to dots. We've had a couple episodes, Ryan and Nate, about the skinwalker and how according to the the Navajo and according to the actually previous to the Navajo the Aztecs and Mayans there was a ritual in which and it was it required human sacrifice and apparently still does according to you know, to, to John who we had in the show and, and also to Mark Carpenter and then we we see these stories of these people becoming coyotes and becoming you know werewolves and these different beings via this the practice of sorcery yeah it's like a spell which we know was taught. And if you if you if you talk about the Gen Six and the trading of technology and knowledge for human wives and the fall and everything that came after that, the Nephilim is where our, our show lives, right? And, you, and absolutely, your 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 two books, the number one on, on Amazon, the you know the the Judgment of Nephilim and the and the Final Nephilim, that's the space. And yet, so I think it's fascinating that it, just in, to make this point, and there's a long winded way to say it, but they know how to do it. Like yeah. they taught people via satanic ritual that this is how you can do it and so that doesn't that doesn't surprise me in some ways actually i didn't really thought about that in that sense but if they're teaching this forbidden knowledge and we would say that that's what it is yeah perhaps some of this is you know perhaps a demonic or or a fallen angel shapeshift nate and i hadn't really thought about the context of that but if that knowledge came from the fallen as, as we see you know in the in, in Enoch, it talks about that, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing you say that just brings my mind. I, I, I'm kicking myself. I, I don't remember the name of the book, but it was written by a, a, a PhD, a doctorate a, um, researcher. His last name was Narby. And he went and spent, I want to say maybe a year or two years in the Amazon uh, with an indigenous community that was uh, harvesting ayahuasca. And he was saying, of course, he's taking ayahuasca and having all these encounters. But he said that, you know, he kept saying how he kept seeing he'd be in a room, you know, with different people from the community and would be basically high or tripping on ayahuasca, however, whatever, whatever the correct terminology is for when you're taking ayahuasca and start seeing people as serpents. Huh. And the artwork from the shamans was all of serpents. It was just unbelievable. And he even showed, uh, you know, some of their ancient artwork where you see, again, the shape of the caduceus that looks like DNA. And it's from centuries ago, these little sketches that they had. And just, again, how he he himself was seeing human beings looking serpentine once he was under the influence of ayahuasca. Yeah, Dr. Jeremy mm. Narby. He there wrote, you go. He wrote the, um, the Cosmic Serpent. Exactly. There you go. That's it. That's it. I feel like, like you know, like on Rogan, where I got to Google this and I'll get you what it is here. But. <laughs> what do you think... I saw this question about the tree of life, right? So what do you think the knowledge of good and evil, this is expanding my understanding of that event, right? Like it's, it's not a simple Sunday school answer. There's something else going on there. There, you know, human beings were, we were immortal. We did have this, I guess, higher state of being, but we had this naivety as well. And I wonder like we, we, we lost sort of that cosmic, power that we had or that and maybe more angel angelic power that we used to have and then we're but now we're 
we have this knowledge of good and evil, but it seems so much more complex than just Sunday school answers we've been given. For it's not sure, really a question, but I'm yeah, just yeah, for to... sure, yeah, yeah. I think that I, I, I think I like the way you described it—that we had a cosmic power, right? That we lost. In addition to understanding right from wrong, obviously, who, yeah. who told you you were naked, right? Like, why did it matter? You know, it's a very strange thing. You know, God, if of all the things of God to say after the mm-hmm. first sin, you know, <laughs> who told you you were naked? Like, why did that matter? Like, there has to be some significance to that, and I think that it could even be that. Adam and Eve emitted light or reflected divine light, right? You know, you see Moses up on the Mount Mount Sinai, which we mentioned obviously earlier for 40 days, he comes down, he's glowing because he's been in God's presence and they have to put a veil, a veil, of course, again, another, I think another typology there, right? He has to have a veil to, because they're so scared of the divine light. There has to be a barrier there to, to, so he can even speak to the Israelites. And so, you know, I spec, you know, I, I theorize that Adam and Eve could have emanated that same type of light. It, re- it also represented their higher consciousness, their high, their higher connection to the divine that was extinguished by sin. Right. And I think that's mm. that that they they weren't just naked physically, that there was it was much deeper that they that sin actually altered them. And that's why God had to banish them. Because their their actual condition, their you know their physiology or spiritual physiologies merged, changed. And I think that's why God said, "Lest they eat from the tree of life and live." God was like, "I can't have them eat from the tree of life because I, if they eat it in this state that they're in now, they're fully corru- they'll be corrupted forever." And so I think it was much more than just a head knowledge of right and wrong as well. Yeah, and that's kind of what you're taught growing up in the church and. You get to a certain age and things get confusing and you don't really understand the story. And a lot of people abandon their faith, sadly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a big (laughs) motivation of what I do is that, you know, we've lost so much and so many people because of these really shoddy explanations of complex passages. And and teach if you're going to teach the Bible and leave out the supernatural, you're just you're really, you're robbing people. You're robbing your students if you're leaving that stuff out. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's, you know, judgment of the Nephilim. I mean, so much of it, it was about my own experiences speaking to people about the faith. I used to witness, you know, old school witnessing with gospel tracks on the streets of New York City. You know, you, oh. you get all sorts of feedback. Let's put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. you yeah, learn things tracks. about your mom and you never even knew. <laughs> <laughs> the strangers are going to tell you. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, but a lot of people, you, a lot of people want to have an intellectual debate with you and they want to actually challenge you and not just insult you, but really challenge your faith. And when they, the first thing they, they bring up is the flood. How could God do that? You know, and when you, if you don't understand the supernatural implications of the flood in the Nephilim, yeah. Genesis 6, how can you, you can't just, to me, you can't justify God's actions or the wars in Canaan. And yeah. that this is a genetic targeted war to, again, save the human race. You can't. And so it goes right to your point. The Garden of Eden, if we're just explaining in a simple, simple way, God is God not only kicked them out and banished them, which 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 could look bad by itself, but then it doomed the entire human race because they made one sin and we're all doomed because of that. It's irrational, but there's Mm -hmm. a spiritual component that we had a connection supernaturally to God that was severed and altered us to the point that we can't be redeemed minus Messiah. Now it starts to make sense that God mm-hmm. pushed them out because of love, not because I'm just angry and I'm irrational. Mm-hmm. Get out. Yeah, yeah. It's like a genetic alter, altered if, it, you know, you're permanently going to, you know, this is going to pass down via whether you want it or not. Exactly. It's, it's, in, it's in the blood almost. In Adam in, will all die, right? In Adam yeah, will all die. So that's, yeah. there it is. So... So well, yeah. the last couple of episodes, I've been thinking about this a little bit more because, I mean, as we learn, the Nephilim, they were worshiping the snake and they're building this the, these serpent mounds and they're constantly building these structures and having these empires as if Satan himself is their god. The Nephilim are, are worshiping the devil. That I think there's something. As God. You as know? God. It wasn't, it, yeah. yeah there's it. something to tap into. I think, again, when you talk about Tower of Babel, there's something in worship, I think, that unlocks power. 
Mm. Right. That's why it's so important to have one world government, to have one world. Because I remember also the Tower of Babel, God said, behold, the people are one. And so it wasn't just that they were building this. It was that they were also completely unified. And I believe there's a spiritual power in that. And that also uh, made me think of another book uh, that I can remember the name of, which is uh, Law Symbol. Dan Brown, his yeah. book after Da Vinci Code, which obviously wasn't as big, but still pretty popular. It was dealing with, with in the book, they were calling it noetic science. And it was the mm. study of an energy that is created when people are in mass. And so it was all about basically the plot of the book was unlocking that. And so I think a lot of that is really the Antichrist agenda. If I can unify everyone in worshiping me, I will unlock some, this greater power. And so I think that's where a lot of the reverence, the reverence of Satan, I mean, to see over and over again, that even the angels have to revere in the Nephilim is all to try and unlock something that's found in corporate, unified, like one mind worship. Oh, that's fascinating. Dang. It reminds me of the Matrix when they like harvest people and they use they're like taking advantage of people. And you think about all these events, and we did some we did some uh, episodes on like the that Travis Scott concert a couple years ago or maybe a year there ago. You go. The spiritual. I mean, the, that was. I mean, what? I mean, the the demonic presence that was there because again, you yeah, have all these people crammed in this you know in this concert. You know, it it's, mm. it unlocks something, and and and, and most concerts are like I mean, concerts are spiritual. Mm. If you have everyone in unison singing and, and gathered together, there's so much spiritual energy. So I think that's a big part of the agenda. And when you talk about the Matrix, which you know I think the first year it came out, I probably saw it 25 times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> although I thought the new one was terrible. <laughs> I don't, it, I don't oh, it was like horrible! It was like a Babylon Five episode. <laughs> it was, it was, it was a so bad. It, it was, was the mockery. worst. Good. Well, we agree. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, the the you think about the Matrix and again being jacked in, everyone jacked in, and all the energy that's harvested because of that. There's mm-hmm. something interesting with the image of the beast in Revelation 13. It, I, I've just been researching. I've been thinking about it and kind of digging into recently. It's not even in any of my books or anything, but it's that it says that the image of the beast, it knows the image will put to death anyone who is not worshiping, right? First of all, I think the image has to, one, one it's given life, right? It's actually alive. It's, we're told the false prophet gives it life. So you have this statue image that actually is alive. It's like the the fulfillment of AI, true right. true artificial consciousness, but also it actually knows globally who is worshiping it. Hmm. How could that? So again, is like, are people going to actually through the mark be kind of jacked into like a matrix type of system? How could it actually know? Okay. I know right now who in Japan is not worshiping me and who is worshiping hmm. me. Like it's going to actually be fully aware of who is worshiping and who is not. And so, uh, Oh, that's something that made me think of the matrix. Like, are people going to actually be jacked into one system via the mark into the antichrist system and into this being this, this artificially created living being that knows whether you're worshiping every day. Or just like, you know, we were always kind of taught growing up that Satan is just an egomaniac and he needs everyone to worship him. But what if it's more like a battery, every single, he needs every single battery plugged in in order to fight God. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's interesting too in the context of what we we hear huh. in John's visions of heaven, right? Which is that the surrounding of the throne of God with worship and the and the incense, the prayers are like incense. It's just it's there's it, it again is this really bad counterfeit antithesis of the order of God, right? Which yeah. is that he is worshipped on his throne. And the prayers of his people are like incense and they're on the throne and, and they sing, holy, holy, holy is Lord. They, they, they sing 24 seven. Yeah. And yeah. that's what he's trying to, he's trying to do that. And when yeah. you think about worship too, I think it's fascinating. This is what I thought of when you say that is that it sounds a lot like compliance too. It sounds like a, a, obedience. We live in a time now where they're trying to track us, all of us and everything we do. And I, I don't think it's a, a, a far leap to say that they'll do that same thing you know, in a, in a compliance standpoint, and whether you want to call that worship, then it becomes worship, and, and maybe in a Stockholm syndrome kind of a way, right, where they track you twenty four seven what you're doing, and if you're complying, we're, we're almost there. Like in the sense of that technology can happen. Like, yeah, well, they do it in China already. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's already happening in China. They lock you down. You can't go within two clicks of your house without special permission. And, you know, in the midst of these wildly communist lockdowns that that, that that they they still are imposing. And that's what triggers in my mind is like, yeah, there's this way they're going to know, but they already kind of have at least the precursors to all that to see it, to track people and to see. What are you doing online? What are you liking? What are you saying? What the last thing's money. And when when money when they can track every purchase and cash is gone, yep. Look at then Israel. They f- then then they can control you so much quicker. We we'll see what happened in Israel today. Was it yesterday or yesterday? No. They're capping out cash pur- purchases. Anything you can't make any purchases over forty four hundred in in cash now. They're on their way to cashless society in Israel. Wow. All places. Ryan, you're a biblical prophecy guy, and it's just like it, it feels like every every page we turn, there's more. It's just getting closer and closer. I mean, yeah. we, it's it's we're racing. We we are we are racing to it. You know, I I, I don't sit a date, but I, I I tell my wife, I'm like, you know, I just like to see you know the kids graduate. Maybe yeah. you can see my daughter get married, and then <laughs> yeah. and then right. it all starts. So <laughs> yeah, right. we need a blurry compound here in, in yeah, right. Middle Tennessee. <laughs> come on, come on down. Yeah, we're, yeah. Some, some of us are stockpiling ammo. No big deal. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you know, with the CERN thing, it's always just more complicated. And I think that like the like what we're talking about reminds me of CERN in the sense that on the surface it appears like, well, this is this scientific experiment that we're we're pulling off on the surface. It feels like, Oh, it's just a concert on the surface. It always just seems like this, this, and maybe sometimes it is, maybe sometimes it is just a concert. And that's the hardest part about this yeah. podcast is, is everyone, they start seeing symbolism in everything and you just go, no, not everything is, but how do you have that discernment? How do you know? Like, because some people go way down these rabbit holes and I think they're in a lot of the wrong rabbit holes because yeah. There's a devil under every rabbits. rock, right? That's a, some yeah, people are living old, a life where there's a devil under, under every rock, and it's like, yeah, and, and you got to balance it out, and that's the thing, you know. As someone, and, I, and, I, and I'm saying this, to, I'm speaking to myself before I speak sure. to everyone yeah. else who's watching this right now, because as someone who's been down so many rabbit holes, <laughs> hours at night researching and looking up everything about the Nephilim and all these things. Yeah. You have to balance it with filling yourself with God's spirit, right? The mm. only thing that's going to keep you grounded is spiritual discernment, right? God does give us vision through discernment to see and test spirits and understand these things. And so I think I compare it to how, you know, I speak to people about the news, right? Like we have to balance as, as Christians, we have to be so careful about our time, right? Yeah. If we're spending more time like watching news than reading the Bible, that's, that's, that's going to be, it's going to affect our, it's going to affect our spirit every day. Right. And so oh, yeah. it's the same thing. Like we can dig these things and trust me, I, I encourage people to do it. I, I've, I do it. So I've been doing it for years. There's nothing wrong with looking into blurry creatures, looking into the Nephilim and all this supernatural stuff into alien, into disclosure. There's nothing wrong with it. But at the same time, we have to give just time for the simple time spent in the word of God, yeah. studying the word of God, Filling yourself with God's spirit, like that's the only thing that's going to keep us sharp, right? Yeah. It's it's it keeps us sharp. It will keep make keep us on the right track and and give us better discernment to know. Because I agree, sometimes a concert is just a concert, and sometimes yeah. it's not. So, right. so it's like you know, but but yeah. I think that the only thing that can keep us discerning is staying in the Word of God daily, mm. staying in prayer daily, and balancing the research and the and and all this stuff and the rabbit holes with with filling yourself with God. Luke, that point you made too about the obedience, right? That, that how that links to like the power and that and generating this this kind of spiritual power, right? It's, it's the same. It goes. I think it goes both ways, right? In our obedience to God, yes. again, just like the yes. singing and the worship, it's there's a power there, and so we have to give the divine power, the good power too. Be the good battery. That's where I was going, Ryan. Well, that's where I was kind of going, right? Like if if you if you love me, then you know you obey my word. If you if you they're, they're too intrinsically connected right and so it has the antithesis has to be true it just just as like you know how do you fulfill the law love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and spirit like so you are obeying the law of god and loving him it, that would mean the same thing on the other side and that's kind of maybe the, i'm glad you articulated that because that's where my mind was it just didn't come out that way was that being obedient to the antichrist to whatever it ends up being to this you know to the it is the antichrist but it, to this to this entity is the same as, as worshiping. If you know what is it? Um, yeah, it amplifies. It amplifies his yes, evil. Yes. yes. Now I, I love what you said too, Nate. Like I, I love that. Like so, listen. Like our show, right? We we want to. 
I think the amazing thing about what what we've kind of done here, Ryan, and, and having guests like yourself and and the people that we have on the show is is it provides such a rich context for for understanding our world and also understanding the Bible. But I love what you're saying because really I, I always want to bring it back to Jesus. Like it, it's easy to focus on on all the crazy stuff and want to understand it. And I think we should want to understand it. We shouldn't put our heads in the sand. Like that is not the place for thinking followers of Christ. But I love that like and what we try to do, I think Nate and I really try to do this, is to bring it all back to Jesus. At the end, of it, we want to point it all back to Jesus, right? Like all this stuff. We want, to, we want to understand all the weird stuff. We want to understand the weird stuff in the scripture, the weird stuff that people are seeing in the world. We want to understand all of this in a, in a, in a biblical paradigm because that's, that's the foundation. And in a biblical paradigm, the foundation is Jesus. It, it, it all points back to Jesus, right? And I, and I think that's important. I think that's the hope at the end of like all the darkness that we can talk about because it's important to talk about. Like you don't want to be mm-hmm. clueless yeah. to all this stuff going on. Well, that's why we dabble in things like the book of Enoch and we dabble because we want to understand the story, want to understand yeah. what Christ came. To. And, and and people just get so, I don't know, it's weird that they just get, especially when you start having a little bit more success and things start happening, you just get more, more and more naysayers and more and more trolls and more and more things that are like saying that there's some secret agenda. But I do think that there is a healthy way to explore things like the book of Enoch and and these other things that give context to Jesus, I think. I mean, the whole book, Enoch 1, is like, it's all about Jesus, I when, I think. It's just constantly talking about that. But I don't, that's a whole other rabbit hole, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it's a good point. It's a good point. And it goes back to Qumran as well, like Dead Sea Scrolls, right? right? You know, the Book of Jubilees is something, again, I, I, I'm, I've i really never looked into it, but now I am because, again, he's it was, I think, the, the the fourth or fifth most present scroll among the scrolls in terms of multiple copies. And so there was some, there had value. Clearly, it was included with all. It was like the Da Vinci Code of the day, right? Like it's right, a bestseller, right. a lot yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But I, but I think that's what separates, you know, what we try to do here is not just get weird for the sake of being weird. Yeah. But but get weird for understanding like the the, the bigger parts of the story. Like you said, you, you're you're interviewing people in the streets of New York and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is why this cataclysm and they don't have any context to understand like and for me it was just like why what is this hairy ape creature doing in the woods <laughs> like it, how does that make sense with all these biblical stories that i know like and some people get into bigfoot and they go see the bible's fake the bible's not true because look we have things like sasquatch and you don't you know what i mean that that's how they interpret these things yeah, well, and i'm like no 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 i think it's the exact opposite exactly we we got the lion like men of moab <laughs> yeah. Yes. Who are those guys? Yes. The lion, <laughs> those the lion face boys. Yeah. Those guys would just say, "Oh, well, that's just people with like crazy hearts and like no fear right. or whatever." Yeah. It's yeah. not. It's not. It's not a physical anomaly that they have. Maybe they know? had no fear T-shirts for the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> Another eighties throwback, hey, right there. Let's go. Yeah, those are big. That's that's those are big. Do. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I had like a whole fleet. I mean, for like fifth grade. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I got that. I got that one. Yeah. I love it, Ryan. I, I have to give give my kids some dinner there. They're hungry. Yeah. They, uh... Thanks, man. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming on. I, I think Ryan, I, I love this because like it was awesome to unpack your books, but like just to be able to sit and 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 have a conversation and use it as a resource. I know you spend the time. Like we talk about experts in ten thousand hours, and that's what why dummies like Nate and I do this is to bring smart people on the show, and then try to open up their brains a little bit to talk about the things that are that we should be talking about. And so, man, it was. It was awesome to have you back, man. This was great. And I appreciate it. And frankly, like a lot of what I've been doing the past few months, uh, I've been on a break for a few weeks. This is the first thing I've done Costa Rica. podcast show wise in, in a month. I've been taking, I took July off, but it's really about let's go getting into anything supernatural. Right. Yeah. Cause really, again, like you said, to your point, I'm researching a lot. Oh, I liked exploring every part of the Bible that deals with the supernatural beyond just the Nephilim, beyond just my books and really making sure that for all the people who follow me or subscribe like that, I want to address the, whatever they want to know about. So I think it's good. I think this type of discussion is so important. And and one last thing I want to throw out there, because as you both of you spoke, it just came to my mind. So I just feel the spirits moving me to say it is that, you know, one of the saddest parts of the Bible when Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem, he says, you did not know the time of your visitation. So prophecy, time, it meant everything. Jesus said, that you've basically, uh, you're now you must, the whole Jerusalem was judged because they didn't know the time. So mm-hmm. studying, pro- he basically said, you should have known prophecy. You should yeah. have known all these things already. You didn't know. And so there's an important goal. 
It's, yes. it's helping our witness of Christ. It's helping to defend the faith. And it's also keeping our eyes on the, the second coming yeah. of our Savior. Yeah. Well, that's, so that's, dude, that's a great cap because, yeah, it, it is it is, is not being surprised by the, by the times, right, and, and by, what's, by what's coming. I think that's so important. And we know that people will be deceived in the end. And so just like they were when, when, the, when, the, when God incarnate came and walked among us in, in, in the person of Jesus. So. And we have this obsession with knowing who our father was, you know, especially as men. You know, we want to know who our father was. And you think prisons are full of men who didn't, who didn't have a father or don't know their father. Absolutely. And, and you, if you want to know your heavenly father, I think it's, it's, a, it's the same yearning and burning inside of you. And maybe part of me thinks that they didn't know that they didn't really know who their father was. They didn't know he was there. They didn't know he showed up on the scene. You know, dad's here, you know, and uh, they were confused because, I mean, Jesus created the, created all of us. And the more we get to know him. And I think the weird stuff, if it gives you more context to know, understand who your father is, then great. If it just gets you weird and, and paranoid, then that's not a good thing. And that's not what we want to do on this show. <laughs> yeah. So, but the weird stuff is welcome. Like we just did an episode on the black eyed kids and, and everyone was like, what are these things? I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> But a lot of people tuned in because it's strange, but they, you know. Yeah. But I but I think ultimately, like Luke said, you know, it just gives you more context of who your father is. And so I, I just, it's always good talking to you, man. I, I appreciate it. And and uh, thanks for breaking your fast and coming on Blurry Creatures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm back. I'm back in business. Yeah. No, absolutely. Tell everybody what you're up to because I know that like one of the, one of the things you're doing is sort of impromptu yeah. off the cuff conversations like this on on your Facebook page, but of course you have Amazon number ones and Judgment Nephilim and yeah. the Final Nephilim. What's what's Ryan Peterson up to these days? Now that he's back from a little sabbatical. Yeah, yeah, back from my hiatus. Had a good time vacationing and chilling with the family. But uh, yeah, so I will be resuming next week uh, Thursday night theology which is you can find on my Facebook, my YouTube channels, where, again, I, I take questions from readers during the week. It can be on anything pertaining to supernatural in the Bible. And I apply my research and I come and just give my kind of do, dig into it, do some research during the week and kind of go to work for my audience. And it's great. We get we got questions all like we did CERN. We've done Leviathan. We've done Mystery Babylon. We've done aliens. We've done, we've done a lot of stuff. So but somehow we keep getting good questions every week. So that's how I've been doing that. So that resumes next week. I'm finishing up the audio book on the final Nephilim now. So I'll be back in the studio on Saturday wrapping that up. And I'm actually filming another. So I do documentaries. I'm doing my third documentary. So I have two documentaries I've produced already. I'm yeah. doing a third one. Uh, you know, I, I, I spoke in Colorado in May at a prophecy conference and I did a segment all about uh, TV shows, movies and books targeted at teens that deal with the Nephilim. And I showed some crazy stuff that pe I mean, people's jaws dropped. I mean, I, I rarely hype up my my presentations, but hey, people were, were stunned. They had no idea what was out there, that there are so many shows that talk about the Nephilim in, oh, and yeah. define them. You know, I showed scenes where people are saying, yeah, it's a Nephilim, it's the hybrid angel it's a half so, human half angelic mm -hmm. being and yeah. and there's and, and movies that point to nephilim as being the antichrist and the heroes and how they're all these shows in pop culture and books are twisting the account of genesis 6 to make the nephilim the heroes that these are the, that these are great love stories and god is basically the villain and so i'm actually so it got such a crazy reaction that i'm mm -hmm. actually doing a full-fledged documentary oh, awesome. on it to like really expose all the stuff that's out there that's really targeting teens preteens adolescents um so i'm so that that'll be I'll, I'll when that drops some... come on back we'll do, we'll do an episode yeah, we'd love yeah, that yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so, uh, that is something we, can... we we touch on because we're i mean listen like everything we do is sort of 80s movies or 80s stuff right but i mean there's a reason we talked about tv stuff at the top that's channeling and programming right channels and programming and i, and I think yeah, we'd love to have you back for that. But oh, know. we've heard it all, man from 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 cartoons to video games, and people love sending us anything related to the ne Nephilim. Oh, oh yeah, like the I Eternals, the video games too. Yeah, stuff. there's a whole yeah. uh, the Dante's Inferno Part Five. <laughs> yep, Mario Kart. Yeah, it's Mario. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's it's really yeah. when the second level of Mario, the original Mario, when he goes down the portal, <laughs> he goes down the pipe into the underground, into the underworld. Hey, here we go. Yeah. We knew. We knew what they were trying to tell us, right? <laughs> the pipe to the underworld. Well, thanks for coming on, Ryan, talking about CERN yeah, right. and portals and the River Jordan 
and Dead Sea Scrolls and all sorts of awesome stuff. I mean, I could talk about this stuff the rest of my life, and I love it. Sure. It's fun. Sure. Yeah, and, I appreciate uh, it. Um, yeah. I, again, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. This is a yeah. phenomenal program. Congrats again mm-hmm. on Thanks, all your man. success. And uh, anytime you want me back, I'm in the building. No all question. Right. Let's, Let's go. Do it. Let's go. Let's do it. Thanks, Ryan. Right. Yeah. Right. And that, hey, when that doc Thanks. drops, for sure, we'll, we'll get you back on. Yeah. We'll, oh, we'll absolutely. Unwrap all that. Cool. Thanks, brother. See you, See you.